There may be evidence that the Obama Justice Department pressured the FBI to drop an investigation of the Clinton Foundation during the heat of the 2016 presidential campaign. The inspector general recently submitted a criminal referral against the fired FBI deputy director, Andrew McCabe, for lying to federal investigators. But buried in that report is McCabe's descri description of a crucial phone call in August of 2016. Now, that's when McCabe claimed that he pushed back hard against someone in Obama's DOJ who seemed to be pressuring the FBI to quash a probe into the Clinton Foundation. Let's discuss the stunning details with former FBI undercover agent James Weddick in Sacramento, California, who handled, I think you handled the corruption, you were head of the corruption uh, task force in Sacramento, I believe, uh, if I got that right. Um, uh, let's let's talk about where we are here on this case. Uh, I had you on radio this morning. And you were so great. I had to invite you on TV. Uh, is this is this normal for an FBI uh, principal associate deputy to call up the uh, FBI and say, kind of kind of slow walk this or eh, to this investigation of the Clinton Foundation? If this is how it went down. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, yes, I ran the uh, corruption squad here in Sacramento for a number of years. Uh, uh, it's the state's capital city, the most populous, largest state of the nation. Uh, I conducted numerous investigations involving suspect corrupt uh, officials, uh, many high-level officials. And I can tell you, that conversation that uh, Matthew Axelrod had with Deputy Director McCabe, asking him to stand down, if you will, the uh, agents working the Clinton investigation was improper. Um, you know, I, I do not agree or support with many things McCabe did, but his pushback there uh, to Justice Department officials telling them they were, you know, influencing or attempting to influence an investigation was improper, you know, I agree with. And uh, unfortunately, it was his uh, disclosure of that conversation that, of course, has caused him problems. And now the OIG has made a criminal referral to the Justice Department. Well, shouldn't Matthew Axelrod, if he hasn't already, if I might have missed his testimony, but shouldn't he be called to testify on Capitol Hill about this? If that's actually how oh, sure. it went down? Sure. I, I don't doubt that there are a number of officials. I don't believe Axelrod made that uh, telephone call on his own. I don't doubt that he didn't discuss the matter with Sally Yates. I don't doubt that there are emails and other text communications uh, surrounding the, the call. Because uh, let me just say this. I worked 35 years and ran the corruption squad for a number of those years. Nobody has made a phone call to me attempting to get uh, us to, uh, influence an, an investigation that was already opened, predicated, and had much, uh, you know, w was valid, if you will. Well, presumably for political reasons. This is in the heat of the campaign. This is in August of 2016. Hillary, at that point, looked like she was probably cruising to victory. You don't want this Clinton found. I mean, I'm just, I'm just speculating. This thing smells, stinks to high heaven, unless, unless this is something that McCabe is also making up. I mean, he was lying about other things. Maybe he could have been lying about this, but it didn't seem, it didn't seem so. James, thank you so much with uh, your wealth of experience, 35 years uh, with the FBI. And meanwhile, we may finally, finally get some answers on whether political bias affected decisions and investigations at the FBI and the DOJ, including maybe even this. Well, Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Trey Gowdy announced that they've made a deal. This is like North Korean deal. And the Department of Justice will turn over documents their committees have requested, finally. Let's get the details firsthand from the House Judiciary Com uh, Committee Chairman, Bob Goodlatte, who joins us in the studio. Uh, Mr. Chairman, good to see you. Uh, how you, do you uh, it, so this is, this is the threat of subpoena. This is the result of a threat of subpoena and perhaps contempt of Congress. Is this not? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we saw the, the same effect with the Comey memos last week. Uh, now the department is working with us and the, and the FBI, by the way, too. Uh, make some changes at the top and uh, bring to bear uh, the forces that be and uh, follow the truth wherever it leads. And I think it's going to lead to some interesting places. So could you, could you actually find some of these documents we were just referring to, perhaps, if this Matthew Axelrod was, was advised by someone else to uh, call over? to McCabe and say, 
uh, we, we, we don't want any more uh, problems with this investigation. Well, absolutely. I mean, our understanding with the Justice Department includes uh, looking at documents that their search terms uh, yield documents, but we'll also be able to say we want to use our search terms uh, to find uh, email communications and other communications and other documents related to that very matter, because that goes right to the core of our investigation and how the FBI handled all the matters related to former Secretary Clinton uh, during 2016 and on into 2017. Um, this was a, a quote from Brad Schultzman, who was uh, referencing whether Sally Yates could have been the person who was uh, at one point, you know, later on, acting Attorney General, uh, but. They're pointing to her on this. In my experience, these calls are rarely made in a vacuum. The notion that the principal deputy would have made such a decision and issued a directive without the knowledge and consent of the deputy attorney general, which it was at the time, is highly unlikely. Uh, he was counsel to the uh, principal associate deputy during the Bush administration. Sally Yates' name, she cer with his ceremoniously quit, remember, in the beginning of the administration? Does this sound uh, plausible? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's good insight. Uh, and that'll also be part of what we'll have the opportunity to examine related to uh, documents for our investigation. So the, the department is now setting up uh, a room uh, at Justice where we will be able to send our investigators down there and see the documents. How many documents? Up to 1.2 million. Uh, not all of those, it's important to understand, not all those 1.2 million documents are relevant to our investigation. That is what was given to the Inspector General. Yeah. And of course, we're very interested in his report as well, but we have our own entitlement and our own investigation to look at those documents. They'll start producing documents. We will then have the opportunity to see them unredacted and then get possession of them, the ones that are most material to our investigation. All right, we did this big uh, segment, my angle, on this these caravans coming toward, why do we call it caravans? Like it's like a circus, caravan, it's, yeah. it's a fun thing. Coming toward the U.S. border, uh, running to rush the border, clearly overwhelm the system. You actually are proposing legislation that would, hand, would, would, would deal with some of these loopholes in this asylum process, which is rife with problems. Congressman, we've got to deal with this. Absolutely. The Securing America's Futures Act, which you said great things about before. We've been working to build up the support for this. This is a good illustration. What's coming toward our border right now is exactly why we need that legislation, because it addresses it in several ways. First of all, uh, it gives the ability of the uh, administration to return uh, people safely to their homes without having to keep them here for a long period of time. And for asylum applications, which are being grown Grossly abused more this than 300,000. This is a 000. joke. 311,000 uh, outstanding asylum applic applications. Most of them never come out for their hearings, and they just go and they live in the United States, and they're uh, they're seeking asylum. They just want and a better life with asylum, better economic situation. Asylum is a good and appropriate consideration. Alexander Solzhenitsyn yeah. came here on political yeah. asylum. 5,000 a year, most years, yeah. now 300,000, it's fraud, it's, total it's scam. abuse, and our bill fixes it. Are you, is this going to have any traction? I mean, the president going to help support president this? president strongly this supports it, and uh, we need to bring the... Republicans the better start doing stuff like this. I yeah. mean, you're doing it, you, you guys are like carrying the load for all these other Republicans, I'm sorry, but the Republicans need to support the president's agenda. You're doing it. We got to get this wall built. This, I mean, this. That's this, also in this bill. Well, you, you authorize it, but we got no money for it. Correct in the bill? Well, that's right. We're an authorizing committee, yeah, We're not appropriators. Well, okay. But that can be part of a final deal. All Absolutely. Right. Well, Congressman, thank you for coming in tonight. We really appreciate your work on this. It's essential that we uh, we deal with these loopholes and finally fix this. There was coordination between Loretta Lynch's DOJ and the FBI. How do you know? Well, I mean, we, we know because we have a number of documents, a growing bo body of evidence, uh, Brian, that now would suggest that Director Comey, uh, who under sworn testimony a number of times have said there was no coordination between uh, Loretta Lynch's DOJ and, and our FBI investigation. Not only was that false, but we know that over and over again now we have emails that would suggest that that testimony testimony was false and at best misled the American public, at worst was lying to Congress. And here we are today with emails, text messages that says that even the no coordination message that Director Comey put out on that infamous day in July was actually suggested by the Department of Justice.
Here's the text. Timing looks like hell, Peter Strzok says to Lisa Page. Will appear choreographed. All major news networks literally leading with the AG to accept the FBI director's recommendation. Yeah, this is awful. Nothing we can do about it. I mean, this is like a third-rate movie playing well, out on text you, messages. These people are supposed to be guarding our secrets and seeking truth and justice. They don't even know how to secure their own texts. Well, it, it's interesting that they would go back and forth saying that the timing looks awful, but there's even another email from the Department of Justice that would indicate that uh, on how to articulate the exoneration of Hillary Clinton. And so as we look at that, there's also additional right. evidence that would suggest that uh, DOJ narrowed the scope right. uh, of the Hillary investigation to make sure gotcha. that uh, she was exonerated. Mark Meadows, thanks for joining us. Uh, keep that staff working because we need to get the facts. Appreciate it. I think we have ample facts revealed to us during this last year and a half that high ranking people throughout the government, not just the FBI, high ranking people had a plot to not have Hillary Clinton, you know, uh, indicted so that she could remain the flawed candidate that she was, which in my view was stupidity. And, uh, and they also had, a, and, and even this Strzok guy talked about this. And they had a backup plan to basically frame Donald Trump. And right. that's what's been going on. This whole thing, in my view, is just total phony. I mean, how would you feel, someone out there in America land, if somebody was just had a phony scheme about you and went on for months and months and months? Yeah, And, and that's what's going on. We're going to discover that the Attorney General Loretta Lynch, her deputy Sally Yates, uh, the head of the National Security Division, John Carlin, Bruce Orr, and other senior DOJ officials and, regrettably, line attorneys, people who were senior career civil servants, violated the law, perhaps committed crimes, and covered up crimes by a presidential candidate. But more than that, they tried to frame an incoming president with a false Russian conspiracy that never existed, and they knew it, and they plotted to, to ruin him as a candidate and then destroy him as a president. That's why this is important. That's why connecting the dots is important, because the FBI now has to be completely reconstructed from the ground up. The, the men and women at the Bureau are great people. That's not who we're talking about. We never have been. We are talking about people like James Comey, McCabe, Strzok, Page, Baker, Price Step, who was a name nobody knows, he's the head of the counterintelligence division, and he was the one who was involved in planning this entire crazy thing involving Fusion GPS, the false dossier, and creating evidence. This, this is what people have to understand. What the Bureau did was, by working with Fusion GPS and giving contractors access to highly classified information which they had no legal right to see, they needed to create something they could give to the court, the Foreign Intelligence Court, so that they could get wiretaps and surveillance taps and email taps and phone taps on the Trump people so that if there was anything, they could find it out. Of course, there was nothing. There, was no, there never was anything. And they created false facts so that they could get surveillance warrants. Those are all crimes. Every single one of those acts constitutes a crime because it was done not for a legitimate law enforcement reason, not for national security reasons, but to create a false case against a candidate, Donald Trump, a president-elect, Donald Trump, and a president, Donald Trump. The FISA court opinion of April 27th of 2017 outlines a series of illegal disclosures to contractors. It is believed that among those contractors were Fusion GPS and CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike is the company that was used to bleach Hillary's computer. CrowdStrike, if what is being reported is true, and I've seen two reports about CrowdStrike being among the private contractors that were given access to raw 702 incidental collection of American citizens under FISA warrants. If that is true, they have committed crimes. 
the bureau who gave them information committed crimes. There is huge civil liability for CrowdStrike and for the FBI officials. And there is, right now, there's at least two lawsuits pending against Mr. Steele, the former MI6 agent who wrote the Steele dossier at the, at the payment of Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS has been sued. I expect if these facts come out from the FISA court showing that these contractors got this information, they will all be sued. Now, they may declare bankruptcy and not be able to pay, but the people don't realize that this is already on the public record, that these things happen. The question which has been blanked out from this opinion is, you can see, this is all dark, all through the opinion. What they've done is they've blanked out the names of the contractors and the names of the FBI and DOJ officials who broke the law. That is going to come out. That's what Nunes has. He has all that information now. He knows what's in these blanks that the court blanked out. The court did the right thing. It's not supposed to reveal that. But once you start doing oversight, constitutional oversight, those blanks go away to Congress. And we will know shortly who the private contractors were that were allowed to break the law by the FBI. This is as bad as it gets. When you have the government, the FBI and the DOJ being absolutely corrupted because of their motivations, and when you have the journalistic community being bought, it seems to me that's, that's pretty bad for all the institutions involved. And journalism is now below Congress in terms of uh, approval ratings. This is not going to help them. What's fascinating to me is how the people who want to defend everything that the Bureau has done or the Department of Justice or the Clintons have turned to a series of narratives uh, to replace the truth. For example, um, once this whole thing broke, when, when President Trump said, I was spied on by the President of the United States, he was laughed at. In fact, he was spied on by the President of the United States, by Barack Obama, under Barack Obama's orders, and under the orders of John Brennan, and Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, and Susan Rice, the National Security Advisor, and Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor. Because what they did, which was part of a scheme, which began in the year 2016, was to try to figure out a way to help Hillary Clinton get elected by exonerating her in her email scandal, in her private server in New York, and then she would be elected and then the problem of Donald Trump would go away. The problem was she lost. And when she lost, they had time between the election in November of 2016 and the time between the president was inaugurated to try and do damage, uh, to cover up what they had done with Fusion GPS and a bunch of other people before the election, and to make it perfect after the election, to secure the storyline. And so, interestingly enough, people, uh, there, there are some real heroes in this story. And uh, part of it is how you defeat these competing narratives. You will recall that first, there's the story about the dossier, the so-called Fusion GPS dossier, which we now know was developed with the assistance of the FBI, Christopher Steele, the former spy from England, Bruce Orr, a senior Justice Department official in the Obama administration, Bruce Orr's wife, who was an employee of Fusion GPS and a Russian expert. That all of a sudden became something uh, that people got worried about uh, on the Democratic side and on the protect the Clinton side. Then all of a sudden, when, the, when the, do, the dossier got even stronger and stronger as a result of the knowledge about Bruce Orr's involvement, the dialogue shifted. And then it became that the dossier really wasn't important because George Papadopoulos, this know-nothing young guy who had been an end-of-the-room foreign policy advisor, was the real guy who got the investigation into the president's collusion with the Russians started as a result of a drunken blathering in a bar to the Australian ambassador who then told MI6 in London. These narratives have developed because the facts are now so strong that there was a brazen plot to exonerate Hillary Clinton and then if she lost, frame the president of the United States 
with a false crime, that this is what they have been forced to do. Um, one of the heroes in this entire story is Admiral Mike Rogers, the head of the National Security Agency. He became the head of the National Security Agency in 2014. In 2015, uh, one of the auditors at the National Security Agency, our electronic surveillance SIGINT masterpiece from World War II, came to him and said, there's some funny things going on at the FBI with regard to 702, which of course is that part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which allows the scooping up of huge amounts of phone call data and uh, emails and electronic data about foreigners. And in the course of that, allows the incidental collection of information about Americans, uh, which is supposed to be kept secret, uh, but wasn't in this case because of the conduct of the FBI and the Obama administration Justice Department officials. Mike Rogers says, okay, let's do an audit. He does this in March of 2016. This is way in advance of the election. He then discovers, as a result of the audit, that the FBI has been sharing this secret data about Americans with not other government agencies, but private contractors. Some of those contractors apparently work for the Democratic National Committee. Some of them work for Fusion GPS. Mr. Rogers, Admiral Rogers, says, okay, uh, the court, the Fisk court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has been lied to. They have not been told about this. And things have been told to them which are not true. He said, I'm going to the court. I'm going to tell the court. Rogers goes to the court on his own and informs the court about these problems. Now, prior to him being able to do that, the Justice Department and the FBI learn about what he's done, about the audit and what he's discovered. And so they go to the court first to inform the court that they have discovered these problems with illegal activity. Doesn't make any difference, it's too late. The court now knows what has happened. So he goes to the court, they go to the court, and then in April of 2016, the FISA court issues this 99-page opinion which I'll bet you didn't even know about until I talked about it this morning. Uh, this opinion describes illegal activity by the FBI, illegal activity by contractors, and it calls it the improper disclosure of raw intelligence about Americans to unauthorized individuals. All of those things that the Bureau did and the contractors were crimes. Now, you wouldn't think, this is a public document now. It's been declassified. You've not seen a single story about this in the Washington Post or the New York Times. So, with this in hand, and remember, uh, uh, Rogers knows all about this before the election. So as soon as the election is held, um, Rogers determined it determines that since there is now a president-elect who has been spied upon, he knows that Trump was the subject of a plot. So Admiral Rogers goes to visit President Trump, President-elect Trump, in New York in November of 2016, on the 17th of November. He's the head of the NSA. He briefs the president. And it is after that briefing, the very next day, that President-elect Trump moves his entire staff out of Trump Tower to Bedminster, New Jersey, where his golf club is, and that's where the transition team stays until Trump Tower is debugged. What Admiral Rogers did was, and this is why the president said that President Obama had wiretapped him, Rogers on that day, November 17th, briefed the president about the illegal activities which had been reported to the, to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance court, court earlier in the year. And the president knew what had happened at that point. Now, interestingly enough, when the outgoing administration found that Admiral Rogers had gone to New York, 
The DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, John Clapper, and John Brennan, the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, asked President Obama to fire Admiral Rogers. Now, President Obama had many flaws, but he ain't no dummy. And he said, boys, it's too late. I'm not going to fire Admiral Rogers because if I do, that'll be the only story about my last days in office, so you can forget it. And Rogers is there to this day. And when this story is written, when it's all over, the great hero will not be Robert Mueller, this, this crazy man that has been made the special counsel. It won't be the people on the Hill except for Devin Nunes, who is a real hero, who has stood up under the most incredible personal attacks from real sleazeballs like Adam Schiff, this, this loony congressman from California. And it, it will be shown that Admiral Rogers uh, saved the day by, by forcing the senior Justice Department officials to, to admit that they had done wrong things. Now, there's another fascinating part of this story. In October of 2016, when Admiral Rogers is going to the court and forcing the Justice Department to advise the court that they had submitted false documents, that they, the DOJ, had submitted, unwittingly had submitted false documents, as they say. Um, Admiral Rogers, uh, is, plans are being made to fire him at that point, which of course never go forward because of what he does by going to New York. Um, all of this has come to a head at that point, and the court is now learning for the first time about this unbelievable activity for the first time in the history of the FISA court. It has been lied to, and according to the court, systematically and ongoing violations of the law. This is stunning stuff, uh, and it's all because of Admiral Rogers. And that's where we are today. We are now at the point where Nunes has discovered this. He discovered it back in March when he went to the White House and all of these documents were turned over to him by the incoming National Security Council staff. Uh, and so now we'll, we'll watch it play out. By the way, in October of 2016, the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the National Security Division at Justice for the Obama administration and the person who was responsible for signing the pleadings that went to the court was a fellow named John Carlin. Once this material was submitted to the court in October of 2016, revealing the violations of the law, Carlin resigned and has not been heard from since. No one could figure out why Carlin resigned. And I, I don't know why he resigned. There was plenty of time left in the administration. He just left. Uh, now, it may have been that you resign because you don't want to be questioned by the inspector general, who at that point had already begun an investigation of the FBI and the DOJ senior people based on Admiral Rogers' complaints. So that's another story that's going to play out. Where is John Carlin and what is he doing? The Russian collusion was a complete fabrication of the Democratic National Committee, the Clinton campaign, Fusion GPS, senior DOJ and FBI officials to create a way to dirty up Trump as a candidate and then destroy him as a president. There is literally no evidence whatsoever that has ever been produced of any conspiracy. And, and let me just say something that I find deeply offensive. The appointment of the special counsel was completely unnecessary. Um, th there was no need for a special counsel. I don't know why Rod Rosenstein did it, but he did it. But there was no justification for it. And in fact, in his appointment letter and memorandum about it, he, he admits there's no crime that's been discovered. But for political reasons, this needs to be investigated. Well, that's just utter nonsense. Look what he's done. To, a, to an incoming president. Look at what he's done to the country by appointing a special counsel. That should have been handed off to a bunch of senior DOJ officials who are being monitored by a political appointee who would keep them within the legitimate bounds of an investigation. Mueller has not brought one charge involving collusion with Russians. He's never going to bring a charge involving collusion because there was none. The bottom line is this. Mueller and the way he has conducted his investigation is an embarrassment to anyone who's ever been a special counsel, which I was. I was an independent counsel. Hiring all of these partisan Democrats to conduct the investigation, he's not naive. But Bob Mueller's been around too long. You can't be that dumb to not realize how horrible it is to have these 
people. These people are not biased against the president. They have an animus toward the president. There is a distinct difference. I believe that his entire investigation, Mueller's entire investigation, has been tainted by this animus. There's no way you can have people who have donated to the Clintons, donated to Obama, represented the Clinton Foundation, represented Clinton individuals in criminal investigations, and then have those people who have given to President Trump's opponent investigate President Trump. I don't know what Mueller is thinking of. Since you're bringing up the Mueller investigation mm -hmm. and the apparent focus on investigating Trump's Russian collusion, isn't it interesting that Mueller and Comey and Rosenstein and, and others were involved in a Russia collusion story for Obama Clinton? Mueller, first of all, never should have been appointed because there was no need for one, a special counsel. That's number one. Number two, he never should have been appointed because he knows James Comey. They're personal and professional friends and have been so for many years. Comey is a target of this investigation. He's clearly been involved in activities which could be deemed illegal and criminal. There's no way Mueller can investigate him or anybody else at the senior people that he worked with. And yet, here he is investigating Russian collusion when he presided over, as FBI director, the investigation into Uranium One which was a clear kickback bribery scheme by the Russians to bribe Bill Clinton as ex-president with speech money, to bribe Hillary Clinton with speech money for her husband and $145 million in contributions to the Clinton Foundation, and to get a result of selling 20% of the uranium supply of the United States to a Russian-controlled company. The notion that Mueller could investigate that, having been a party to the investigation, is ridiculous. But here's the other thing. Mueller, who was FBI at the director of time, knew about the Uranium One investigation of Russian corruption and bribery. Did he go to tell James Comey or anybody at the Justice Department that this case was under investigation and that they should warn CFIUS the committee that approves foreign investment, did he go? And if he went to see somebody in the Justice Department, like let's say he went to see Eric Holder, and Eric Holder, who sits on CFIA, says, uh, I don't think that's relevant to the sale of Uranium One. Or did uh, Eric say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll let him know. We do not know what CFIA was told about Uranium One. There have been published reports that they were told nothing about it. And here's the other part of this. If Mueller knew that this was there, why didn't he go to CFIUS on his own and say, I don't know what you're being told, but I'm going to report to you uh, that this is pretty serious stuff and you need to know about it. He didn't do that. Why didn't Mueller do that? And so what we're left with is this nagging sensation that all of a sudden these really great investigators lose all of their skills and nobody talks to anybody about Uranium One. The other thing is this, everybody always says in defense of Hillary, well, she was only one of nine. There were nine agencies, but they forget the, one mo the most important fact of all. It only takes one vote to stop a deal, hers. And you know what? She was bought. She wasn't going to vote no. She, wasn't, she knew about the bribery that was going on. Her husband was involved in it. She could have stopped the Uranium One sale with one vote. That's all it takes in CFIUS. If one member of CFIUS, one of nine, says no, the, it is done. She didn't vote no, and she could have. So the answer to this is, it's not that she was one of nine, it's that she was one of nine, and she didn't stop it. When there is a federal grand jury, uh, in, in addition to the Nunes Committee investigation into the State Department, uh, people will be forced by subpoena to give testimony, a senior Department of State officials who are currently there or who have left. I think it will be demonstrated that they colluded with Clinton administration uh, representatives and campaign officials and people like Sidney Blumenthal and Cody Shearer who passed on uh, completely unreliable information which they hoped would be passed along to the FBI and in fact it was and that information was used fraudulently to obtain FISA warrants. This is why, Lou, the only way to get these answers once the Nunes Committee is done 
is to have a federal grand jury force all of these State Department people, CIA, DNI people, FBI, DOJ senior people under oath in a grand jury. It's the only way we're ever going to get the full story. And to add another twist, Lou, Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, is a witness. He should be recused from this altogether because he's going to have to testify why he signed a FISA application. Comey and Strzok and all of those people, including senior Justice Department officials, this was a plot, a brazen plot to exonerate Hillary Clinton in the email server case to make to, to ensure that she became president. And if by chance she lost, part of the plot was to frame Donald Trump with a false crime. And that's why the Steele dossier was used. It was designed to create a false narrative about Trump and his people and to be used ultimately against them if Hillary Clinton lost. This is why this is the single most important scandal of the last 50 years, because senior DOJ and FBI officials engaged in conduct that was designed to corrupt an American presidential election. It wasn't the Russians who corrupted the presidential election. It was the American officials at the Department of Justice and the FBI. I think we have ample facts revealed to us during this last year and a half that high-ranking people throughout the government, not just the FBI, high-ranking people had a plot to not have Hillary Clinton, you know, uh, indicted so that she could remain the flawed candidate that she was, which in my view was stupidity. And, uh, and they also had, a, and, and even this Strzok guy talked about this, and they had a backup plan to basically frame Donald Trump. Right. And that's what's been going on. This whole thing, in my view, is just total phony. I mean, how would you feel, someone out there in America land, if somebody was just had a phony scheme about you and went on for months and months and months? Yeah, and, and that's what's going on.